a cabinet of curiosities. It was the type of artifact an 18th century gentleman student of history, the arts and natural philosophy might export home at great expense from the colonies during his grand tour, and spend the rest of his life populating with objects of aesthetic, historical and scientific interest. This unusual object had however arrived conveniently already replete with a comprehensive collection of rarities, and apart from some incongruities in styling, provenance and scale it settled well into its new location against the painted and embroidered silk-covered north wall of the atrium, just below the mezzanine. This eight-foot-high behemoth of stately Japanese furnishing had mysteriously appeared one night, with brief instructions strung on a slip of paper from the key. Exquisitely manufactured in black, and metallized deep teal, lacquer, inlaid with ivory, mother of pearl, and tortoise shell. Embellished with the finest partridge borders composed of diagrammatic hierarchies of escaping winter cranes transmuting bacteria, insects, mollusks and various flora. And masterly, seemingly moving, insert glass lenticulated water and cloud formation panels in relief within micro-landscapes of buildings and shrines, colloquial narrative figures in pursuit on oriental bridges and in boats on rivers interweaving to distant mountains swathed in shimmering mists. Chasing down either side cascaded the perhaps rather disproportionately assertive, sinuous musculatures of two magnificent, leonine genoi ivory dragons, meticulously cast in fading gilt tourmalu sections, whose tails lashed coiled together at the top above an Arabic numeral animated lunar clock, thus framing the piece with a crest of feather-like turquoise fans, with garnet and gilt barbs, and whose fearsome man-sized heads grimaced at knee level inlaid with broad flash black rippling opal scales and, catching the light, from behind sliding iridescent glass nictating membranes, blazing yellow topaz and quartz eyes, presumably mounted on some hidden staggered pendulum mechanism which moved them about periodically in the most lifelike and intimidating manner, triggered by minute variations in air pressure, or the vibrations of voices or footsteps perhaps, almost as if focusing on particular activities or individuals in the room. The gaping mouths with curled pink articulated glossy coral tongues behind razor rind thinly carved and curving ivory teeth. A great, venous lion claw pedestal arm of each clasping dark opaline green, gemstone inlaid and enamel detailed viridescent, occluded crystal continented globes set, on improbably diminutive worn brass casters. One could, on occasion hear machinery operating quietly within which gave the most peculiar impression of it somehow aspirating, and in constant operation even prompting the usually rational gents to modestly drape kerchiefs over the asynchronously staring visages of these, most observant of salivating synthetic lizards when desirous of privacy. They had scanned it for electromagnetic activity and transmissions across multiple frequencies and found it dry. But nonetheless, Sometimes they found themselves speaking in hushed tones before its presence, even concealing their lip movements, even going to the measures of whispering Russian in the bathroom, as if the mahogany beneath the lacquer or the silica amidst the veneer could somehow absorb their thoughts, their identities, but nonetheless, so delightful and abject it was worthy of a little spit and elbow, grease a little Mr. Sheen with linseed, beeswax, assuming it to be an anonymous gift from a certain well-landed St. Petersburg scopophile, or, Shenyang collector, of beautiful things. If it had screamed ostentation apropos the gaudy luxury of its day, now, effectively softened by the patina of paraffin and wax ash residues and dust, ultraviolet rays and gentle oxidization, the overall effect was of a certain faded and opulent grandeur that was seldom if ever achieved, or imitated, to the discerning clearly a clever reproduction but, whilst the era remained a mystery, the effect was most convincing. Echoing the sides of the cabinet, a softly iridescent machine tooled rippling enamel chiroptron wing of each dragon strung with phosphorescent veins, formed the main design of the bow-fronted doors which could not be opened unless the key had been inserted, turned 430 degrees anti-clockwise, and then, the delicate brass handle bearing the Grand Out Regional Maker's monogram, a Cyrillic K and capital F, which powered whatever mechanisms lay within, 
had been rotated ten and a half times, but again this eventually seemed merely a formality. The key might then be turned a further 120 degrees clockwise, tilted downwards, turned again likewise, the hands of the clock would, rather worryingly rotate to represent a quite different time of day, and then, always accompanied with an aroma of ozone, the leaves would click softly and might be opened to reveal a gallery of more than 200 differently sized veneered and inlaid and numbered panel drawers and glass fronted display compartments arranged symmetrically around a central proscenium style arch, over two glass columns containing counter rotating glass water screws agitating tiny geometrical forms suspended in some viscous solution where might be placed candles or spirit burners on either side into ground crystal lensed receptacles thereby to focus light onto the extendable desk and the two side and central compartment with different effects of modulated sunlight which would not open until precisely 10 drawers or compartments had been opened and their contents examined they had had a vague dispute for several weeks as to who was nightly rearranging the contents of the cabinet and why, until one night after an exhaustive poker and vintage malt marathon, they decided to operate it once more that day around midnight, and found to their surprise that the contents had silently rearranged themselves again during that very evening. Above the extendable tooled green leather riding slope there were two compartments central on either side of the proscenium microscopically rendered in perspectival trompe to show an elegant 16th century Dutch reception room with a formal parterre garden beyond, bathed in an ethereal light, each housing a mechanical figure of some 12 inches in stature. On the left side was a fully functioning reproduction of the Turk, again clockwork, which could be carefully removed from a complexly geared fulcrum to confound guests at a game of tabletop miniature chess without losing once in the several months of examination, and on the other side, the figure of a turbaned girl, with a tiny pearl earring seated at a tiny harpsichord upon which sat a little cheery terrier whose head would occasionally nod in tempo and tail wag periodically. The model would itself select and improvise from a seemingly exhaustive repertoire of Bach's clavierwork, with a resonance and emotive power that quite belied its diminutive scale. Strangely, over the several dozen times they had operated the cabinet, never twice had they discovered the same objects or collections in the same places, some objects had been seen once and never again, and so, Having eventually composed sequential lists of the numbers of the respective drawers and compartments, and the number of objects and collections they had concluded, quite incomprehensibly, that there were many more of the latter than the former, which of course was quite impossible in a logical world. Yet, it was not to be denied, that certain objects, having been examined once, were never to appear again and hence the cabinet became referred to as the Peary Box for it was reasonably to be concluded that only sprites or Peary would conduct such a baffling phenomenal ruse. And so, it was not until compartments examined, a match played and an opus enjoyed, and the figures replaced in their respective locations that the center compartment would operate, by pressing a series of small numbered levers in the same sequence of numericals as the objects that had been observed. Then, the swathes of wood-carved velvet-like curtains of the center proscenium would concertina, to reveal another, larger automaton of a boy at a desk with an inkwell and quill wearing a student's cap with a small badge pinned to it. The automaton of a yellow canary bird would first draw a blank card from a box with its beak and place it before the figure and then begin to sing and flutter its wings occasionally as it observed the boy anoint his pen with ink and methodically begin to write. A painted disc of heavens would revolve from day to night behind the window aperture, a tiny candle with a miniature flickering electric light to represent the flame would rise from a hatch in the desk and his little brows would miraculously lower and the pink end of a tongue appear at the side of his mouth in a perfect expression of rapt concentration, and each time the resultant words on the card would be as much of a mystery as the last. Neither puns, riddles acrostics or syllogisms or any other of the various word puzzles, sensible formulae, stratagems or quotes they could discern. Perhaps relating to the order and contents of the drawers selected, such beautiful glossolalia of messages, executed in the most exquisite curlicues of florid, renaissance calligraphy, 
and so the hands of the clock would return to represent the original time of day. The inscrutable beaming face of the automaton student would dim, its head lower as if sinking into contemplation, the hands of the girl would withdraw from the keys, and her head, slowly turn wistfully toward the garden, and the Turk, would set out the pieces of the chessboard for a new game with unsettling urgency, and suddenly come to rest, and so the machine would seem to cease all activity, and they considered the words on the cards they were collecting, were they retroactive or predictive? With puzzled nods they both agreed to further observe the cabinet, and the crystalline lenses of the dragon's eyes closed, as they seemed to continue observing the gentleman, likewise, 